Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out to greet our special guest, Steve Allman, tonight. My name is Laura Wilson, and I'm a member of the board um, of the Friends of the Public Library. And I'm happy to welcome you here tonight. And I'm also very grateful that Steve came. He is an old and dear friend of mine and um, never ceases to entertain. So I'm so glad he can join us. Um, I'll just read a brief bio and let you know a little bit about him if you don't know already. And uh, to let you know, he will be signing books in the reference room after, in the back room here. So you're welcome to meet him in person and get a book if you'd like. So Steve Almond is the author of nine books of fiction and nonfiction, including the New York Times bestsellers Candy Freak and Against Football. His work has been published in a half dozen foreign countries and anthologized in Best American Short Stories, The Pushcart Prize, Best American Erotica, and Best American Mysteries. Steve hosts the New York Times Dear Sugars podcast with Cheryl Strayed and is a regular contributor to NPR's Cognoscenti and Here and Now. Currently, he teaches in the Neiman Fellowship Program at Harvard. Steve's fiction and nonfiction come from a place of great integrity and humility. He channels his creative rants into provocative short fiction and essays that inspire us all to question matters of morality and authenticity. Steve's work reveals that honest self-expression is not only the key to our democracy, but the beating heart of our human experience. Please help me welcome Steve Allman. Okay, good. Let's not stand on formality here. Um, what I'll mostly want to do is uh, answer your questions. This book is more or less an attempt to answer uh, a pretty basic, simple question, what the hell just happened to our country? Um, and the answers are pretty complicated since it was a long time coming, I think. Um, but I just want to read a little bit, a few sections, and then I'm mostly interested in just taking questions, or perhaps people would just like to weep publicly. <laughs> too. I do that often. Um, the, the premise of the book is that um, as a, as a species, we're a story-making species. That's how we construct meaning. That's how we understand the world around us and the world inside of us. And when the stories that we construct are, uh, have a, a good intention, a noble intention, a merciful intention, like the Beatitudes, for instance, the Sermon on the Mount, then the outcomes are good. People's moral imaginations are enlarged, their humanity is enlarged, and they act in a more generous and kind manner. And by contrast, if the stories that they tell are bad stories, it's not a very liter uh, literary word, not a very sophisticated word, but I mean stories that have a conscious or unconscious intention of uh, blunting our empathy, of sowing discord, of trying to enlarge sort of personal power or profit at the expense of the collective good, then the outcomes are inevitably terrible. And rather than getting lost in the um, outcomes, which every time you open your browser, there's sort of a fresh atrocity. Uh, it makes much more sense to uh, try to step back from history and understand the bad stories that, that led to those bad outcomes. So an example, uh, one of the first examples I mentioned, the book would be like the bad story of race. This idea that was invented in the colonies, before that, but in the colonies for the American experience, that somehow there was some imaginary pigmentary alliance between Europeans with you know, pale skin uh, that bound the indentured servant to the, uh, to the plantation owner. It was a way of distracting people from uh, people who didn't have as much money or resources from economic justice by ginning up racial resentment, creating this idea of race. And in fact, it's been an incredibly durable and useful thing for people who are interested in acquiring power. It's a lot of what we discovered about what happened in the 2016 elections. Very easy to see in the case of slavery, for instance, or Jim Crow laws, but part of what we're seeing, for instance, down in Georgia is its own kind of more insidious um, um, example of that. Another bad story is the idea that America is a representative democracy, which was never true. You know, all men are created equal and so forth was written by a guy who owned people. Um, and uh, it, it's a wishful ideal, but it has never been an actual reality in the United States. And uh, the fundamental idea is if we're not going to trace it back and be honest about the origins of all these bad outcomes, then we're inevitably going to be vulnerable to the next bad political actor or demagogue that comes along. You can get rid of a particular political actor or demagogue, maybe, hopefully, 
Uh, but if you don't trace it back and start to undo some of the bad stories, you're still vulnerable. Um, and the lens that I use, since I'm not an academic, I'm not a professor of you know, political science, I'm not even a journalist, I used to be a journalist, but I stopped uh, practicing as a journalist you know, several years ago, uh, I use literature, I'm a writer, so I use throughout the book novels and, and other writers to understand and interpret what's going on. So I'll read a little bit of uh, what that sounds like. As I struggled to make sense of the 2016 election, my mind kept spiraling back to one particular scene in American literature. Ahab, perched upon the quarterdeck of the Pequod with a prosthetic leg fashioned from a whale's jawbone. This is from Moby Dick, obviously, right? And there appears Ahab. He's got his leg has been fashioned from a whale bone. The captain has come to announce the true nature of his mission, which is not economic in nature, but deeply personal. He seeks revenge against the whale that maimed him, and exhorts his crew with a soliloquy, Trumpian in pitch, if not diction. Here's what Ahab has to say. <laughs> All visible objects are but pasteboard masks. He's kind of roaring. If man will strike, strike through the mask. How can the prisoner reach outside except by thrusting through the wall? To me, the white whale is that wall shoved near to me. Sometimes I think there's naught beyond, but tis enough. He tasks me, he heaps me. I see in him outrageous strength with an inscrutable malice sinewing it. The, that inscrutable thing is chiefly what I hate, and be the white whale agent or be the white whale principal, I will wreak that hate upon him. Talk not to me of blasphemy, man. I'd strike the sun if it insulted me. That's not even the subtext of every presidential tweet. It's the actual text, <laughs> by which I mean that he's always, everyone, it doesn't matter, just find a, a, an enemy or a, you know somebody, I would strike the sun if it insulted me. Tweet, hashtag. <laughs> it is this volcanic sense of grievance that fuels Melville's saga that binds the crew of the Pequod to their leader. Ahab's quenchless feud seemed mine, Ishmael tells us rather helplessly, who can blame the kid? Ahab is something like a natural force, a vortex of vindication, as mighty as the beast he pursues. And I'll just skip ahead just to ruin the end of the novel for you. <laughs> We're in a library, so I feel I can ruin an American classic for you. They chase the whale for four years. They find the whale. It does not go well. The whale uh, kills everybody involved, including Ahab, with the exception of Ishmael, who survives by clinging to this coffin that's made of American wood. Symbolism alert. <laughs> Melville is offering a mythic account of how one man's virile bombast can ensnare everyone and everything it encounters. The setting is nautical, the language epic, the illusions biblical and Shakespearean, but the tale, stripped to its ribs, is about the seductive force of the wounded male ego and how naturally a ship steered by men might tack to its vengeful course to which the collective world of women says, tell me something I don't know. Okay. The plot of Moby Dick pits man against the natural world, but its theme pits man against his own nature. The election of 2016 was in its way a retelling of this epic. Whether you choose to cast Trump as agent or principal hardly matters. What matters is that Americans joined the quest, whether in rapture or disgust, we turned away from the compass of self-governance and toward the mesmerizing drama of aggression on display, the capitalist id unchained, and all that it unchained within us. Trump struck through the mask, and it was enough. When I started writing this book in the months after the election, I was furious and frightened, worn down by decades of disappointment, and determined mostly to launch harpoons at those I imagined to be my adversaries. I'm struggling in these pages to see Trumpism in a different light, as an opportunity to reckon with the bad stories at the heart of our great democratic experiment, and to recognize that often embedded within these bad stories are beautiful ideals, like all men are created equal, right? Uh, and even correctives that might help us to contain the rage that has clouded our thoughts. I've taken Ishmael as my guide here, for while it's true that he falls under the spell of Ahab's folly, as did I, as did I. He is also its only surviving witness and chronicler, the voice left to impart whatever wisdom might be dredged from the deep. Amid the spectacle of a mad captain and his murderous quarry, 
We mustn't forget that Moby Dick is a parable about our national destiny in which the only bulwark against self-inflicted tyranny is the telling of the story. So I'll read just a couple of other quick sections that one of the things that happens with uh, books that are really of enduring values, they see, keep seeming smarter and smarter and more and more relevant. And that's what I find with a lot of the authors that, uh, whose books I, I talk about. They're just like, oh, they saw it. They saw their own version of it 200 years ago, 100 years ago, 50 years ago. Um, uh, one of the things I've tried to do in the book is to suggest that it's, there, 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 is, there are no such thing as bad people. I'm not a big fan of the idea that there's, there are bad people and that all the virtue is located on one side and all the iniquity on the other. I think we get into a lot of trouble. I think what I say is everybody, all human beings, as a part of the human arrangement, are filled with good stories and bad stories. And they're always doing battle in some way. And we get into a lot of trouble when we start to think of um, uh, personally or sort of our political coalition as having uh, the franchise on goodness or decency or whatever else. People are complicated. Um, so here's something that sort of speaks to that. We now know that many voters, especially older whites, haunted by the terror attacks of 2001 and a rising demographic tide, are willing to see the rights of Muslims, immigrants, and people of color abrogated. But so too there are Americans who look upon these abrogators as an unruly mob, impervious to moral logic, angry, armed, and dangerous. And as we sort ourselves into like-minded communities, both online and off, the divide widens. Politicians and media executives, marketers and algorithmists mine this division for profit, presenting visions of the other side so monstrous that we retreat into the psychic comfort of our own righteousness. One of my journalism students captured the crisis quite succinctly in the form of a question. What do you do if, no matter what you write, the reader won't believe you? It's an epistemological crisis. I thought about how new the precept of the Enlightenment, science, reason, equality, are within the flickering span of human history. Perhaps the regression of our fourth estate is just the visible symptom of some much deeper moral regression in the body politic, a return to ancient superstitions. Perhaps we yearned for a style of leadership that rejected Enlightenment altogether that affirmed our primitive impulses. Perhaps we authored a story in which the resurrection of the American spirit required the shuddering of the American mind. I hope not. And I wanna just read one more little bit and then we'll just take questions and have a conversation in this beautiful library with Henry David for a peeking over my shoulder and saying, really? That's all you got? Emerson? Okay, well, there it is. I, Thoreau's in the other one? Okay. All right. Over where the Thoreau rug is? Okay, gotcha. Um, all right, well, Emerson's probably not too impressed either. So this is just a little story that I think speaks to um, uh, kind of this idea of trying to dispel. I'm not interested, I wasn't interested in writing a book um, that sort of set out, uh, that, that was just aimed at, you know, sort of one part of the American population. As a country, we're all responsible for uh, the, the kind of government and leadership we have. Uh, you know, you're responsible regardless of what your actions are. Um, I think especially responsible are the 104 million people who didn't exercise their franchise in the last election, but I think all of us in our own way have to take some responsibility. On the day after the election, I went swimming with my son Jude. We were in Florida, this is the day after the, the presidential election. We were in Florida at a writing conference and on the way to the hotel pool, I spotted a young father with his daughter who looked to be about three. And at this time I had a three-year-old too. She was seated on the chaise lounge next door to dad, happily munching on potato chips. Let's not have any more snacks, the dad said. It's going to be dinner soon. The girl continued to feed chips into her mouth at a slightly greater clip. <laughs> shoveling them in there. Good luck with that, I said to the dad ruefully as I passed by. He laughed and we felt that instant kinship shared by fathers of young iron-willed daughters against whom we know ourselves 
to be essentially powerless. <laughs> Some minutes later, my son pulled me to his side in the shallow end uh, of the pool. Look at that man, he whispered. Look at what he's wearing. I glanced up and saw the young father with whom I just shared a moment of levity, a bright red Make America Great Again hat uh, perched on his head. Jude wanted me to react with horror, I think, or at least indignation, but I had no idea what stories had led this guy to put on that hat. I knew only that he was a father like me on vacation, uh, uh, an American on vacation and at the mercy of his lovely daughter. To make any further judgment about him would be a failure of moral imagination. The real question then is what stories guide our fellow citizens? How have these stories led so many to squander their franchise, to accept the idea that we can be united by those who sow discord or made great without admitting what, in our weakest moments, we are? Amid the constant prod of monetized distraction, can we slow down and start to connect the dots between our compulsive consumption of entertainment and the degradation of our public discourse between the bread and circuses and the corrupt leaders? Can we activate what the writer David Foster Wallace called the deep need to believe? If we're ever going to get out of this mess, we can no longer fritter away our passion on tribal contempt. We have to fight in a new way. We have to be the fools in charge of forgiveness. Um, and I'll read uh, one more just little paragraph that tries to elaborate on that point a bit. People sometimes get a little bit um, frustrated when I say that, talk about forgiveness. <laughs> the story of America is in some ways quite simple. We're a nation born of high ideals and low behaviors. The land of all men are created equal and slave labor. We've been engaged in a pitch struggle ever since between greed and generosity, between the comforts of ignorance and the burden of moral knowledge. Nobody knows how the story ends because we haven't written it yet. We know only that it belongs to us, our actions, our convictions, our doubts. We can pretend that we live apart from those who suffer, that we owe them nothing. But I can't think of a single story, at least not one I could find in a church, one I would read to my children that accords with this view. Okay. So that's all I'm going to read, but I'm uh, delighted to answer questions. If people have them, we can also just kind of sit in a stunned silence for a while. <laughs> Fine with me. Uh, probably not as much fun as answering questions. I have a question. Yeah? Actually, I have about 40 questions. Okay. <laughs> well, limit yourself to one if you can. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and I find a pattern that uh, progressives do a really terrible job of telling stories and conservatives do an excellent job of telling stories. Mm -hmm. um, the only exception, honestly, that I can think of is Barack Obama, who really didn't have a hell of a lot to offer as a politician mm -hmm. other than his story. Mm -hmm. um, and he got elected and uh, was enormously popular, although he says not as popular as his wife. My question is, do you think that there's something inherent in the two political sides yeah. that uh, make it impossible for one side to tell a coherent story? I will give you the example of Hillary Clinton, who had how many years to think of a story? Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, yes, I do think that, that uh, in terms of storytelling, there is a distinct advantage that it's asymmetrical warfare in our political discourse for a couple reasons. One, because uh, people on the left, generally speaking, are, are genuinely concerned with governance. And they also are much more reluctant to depart from the facts in a flagrant manner. Okay? But the real disadvantage they have is that when the story they have to tell about healthcare, for instance, is this story. We would like to appreciably uh, uh, increase access to health care amongst vulnerable populations by uh, tinkering effectively with a mostly privatized health care system, uh, providing subsidies, dot, dot, dot. That's the story. They cannot, I mean, Bernie Sanders got a fair amount of traction saying everybody should have health care. But the central story is we would like to appreciably uh, a better health care delivery given the 
compromises inherent in the current system. The story that the right told was much more simple. The left wants to take over medicine. And when they take it over and it's run by the state, they're going to kill your grandmother. That was the story they told. Is that a good story? No. Is it an effective story? It absolutely is. There's always an advantage if you're willing to say to people, they're coming for your way of life, they're coming for your religion, they're coming for your guns, and they're coming for your granny. They have a structural advantage. Let me give you another example. The story of climate change. People who are political actors of good faith on the left are stuck with the story. And the story is, we've been roaring drunk on petroleum for 200 years, and the planet's thermostat has gone kaplooey. And unless we wean ourselves from the, our culture of convenience, we are damning our children to an apocalyptic hellscape. That's the story that is the story the left, in good faith, you have to try to tell. Here's the story, here's the story that the right has to tell, the right tells. There are a bunch of snobby academics who think you're stupid, who are trying to make you feel guilty for driving your SUV so that they can get money to, so they can earn a bunch of money, you know, from the government to conduct their frivolous studies. Now, I'm not asking which story is more accurate. I'm saying there is a structural advantage if you are willing to stoke people's primal negative emotions. And if you're unconcerned with having to honor any of the promises that you make about the actual task of governance, you find fault with Hillary Clinton, but it is not Hillary Clinton's fault. And I was, you know, I was a pretty serious Bernie Sanders supporter. I was not as enthusiastic about Hillary Clinton, although I, I think she was a victim of what I affectionately think of as dick lash as well as white lash, okay? So there was a lot that, was, that she was um, sailing into, but it's not her fault that 10% of the coverage was about policy and that 90% was about fundraising and was about horse strategies and was about scandals and insults and so forth. She tried to tell a story and there was simply no place that if she set out a detailed set of policies and there was, it is not her fault that the media environment is no longer presenting elections as a contest of ideas, but as a kind of, as almost gladiatorial combat. There wasn't one question in the debates about climate change. So before you blame individual, moral, you know, individual political actors, you have to step back and say, well, what are the kinds of stories that the right tells? And what are the kinds of stories that the left tells? Well, what kind of story could we tell that uh, is, is inspiring as theirs is destructive? Like, for example, like I said, Obama got elected. John yeah. Kennedy, you know, uh, uh, began the moon, the, the, the journey to the moon, which really was a, a, a military exercise, but he didn't frame it that way. He found a better way to tell that story that was inspiring. Yeah. Again, I do think that there is a way that um, the left could speak more forcefully in the language of values and in a, in a more morally explicit way, and I wish they would. But I also think that a lot of what drives the discourse is the meanest thing you can say, the most combative thing you can say, the most aggressive thing you can say. And part of the effect of a bad story is that it ends up displacing better stories. Every time Trump you know, tweeted or insulted or did something uh, outrageous, that became the story that everybody was responding to. I think of it as the Ahab factor. And that displaces from the public discourse any more serious discussion of the appreciable differences that the candidates had in policy, what they planned to do, it wouldn't have been very difficult for somebody in the media, uh, or uh, I don't think they would ever do it, but during the debates or some other, uns, you know, if they ever got Trump, all they had to do was say, could you talk a little bit about the 13th Amendment? Or could you describe what the role of the presidency is as outlined in the Constitution? Or could you speak to what the 19th Amendment is? And it would have just been radio silence. Do you see what I mean? It wouldn't have been very tough to actually ask him a question that revealed that he was patently unqualified to, you know, run for dog catcher. Um, I, I don't think 
Hillary Clinton or the left can be blamed for the kind of media environment that always is going to privilege a, 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 an argument or a scandal over a substantive policy discussion. Although I absolutely agree that um, you know, the left doesn't do a good job of speaking forcefully. But part of the reason is because we are in this duopoly where they too are beholden to corporate interests. You know, they're, they're trying to wean themselves from it, but they're, you know, they have no hope. The, the larger problem is that our political system is uh, essentially kind of uh, the loudest voices are purchased with millions of dollars. Uh, you know, you see it all the time and people like Beto O'Rourke or Bernie Sanders are trying to sort of say, look, we want to be run by people. But the larger problem is why are elections, why, are there, why is there outside money in elections at all? Why have they become a sort of uh, uh, infiltrated? And, and that really traces back, at least in the modern era, to Watergate. Once Watergate happened, they passed a raft of campaign finance reform measures all of which were intended to get money out of politics. And they did so fairly effectively. And they were stripped away bit by bit by the right um, so that by 2016, every one of those reforms that had uh, passed in the years after Watergate had been, um, had, had been removed from the books. So, uh, yeah. Absolutely, that's one of the, yeah, that was one of the big decisions. Um, why, why isn't there popular outrage? Corporations. Well, I think Bernie Sanders, look, at the same time that Trump was um, providing great entertainment, which is what it was, and, and juicing the ratings because he would say outrageous things that were sort of beyond the pale, and uh, at the same time that was going on, Bernie Sanders was trying to make very basic suggestions about sort of sweeping policies that would, in a sense, redirect the conversation to economic justice and away from cultural wedge issues and racial resentment and, 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 uh, and he did quite well. He didn't do quite well enough to you know, get the nomination, but I do think that he galvanized a lot of pop, genuine populist sentiment around um, a realization that it is the job of government not to be in alliance with a kind of corrupt set of business people, that special interests should be um, removed from politics or human interests should always come first. And, you know, I think it would have been very interesting if, if he had uh, run against Trump, although I still think that if you have a, an inflammatory story to tell, if you're willing to go to that dark place, you're always going to get more oxygen. And the oxygen in our culture is attention. And that's something that is almost cuts beneath politics in a way. It's more at the level of human nature. Um, people, the way I put it in the book is that one of the bad stories that we're contending with is that people tend to exalt their grievances as a way of hiding from their vulnerabilities. So people ask, you know, why would somebody vote to have their, you know, to, to elect a party or a candidate who's stated that they want to um, cut off their health care? close a rural hospital or end su a subsidy program that allowed them to get uh, insurance for their family you know, relatively cheaply? The answer is because they were more interested in other stories that were about their grievance, about some dark other hovering at the border or immigration or whatever it was that got them focused on what they're grie aggrieved about rather than facing how much they depend on the government and need the government to act in their interest. Do you see what I mean? It's not just that. I mean people that are employed by corporations. Uh, that's the thing, that's the yeah. point about the popular outrage against corporations is we're all beholden to them. We depend on them right. for our livelihoods. And I think that goes yeah. back to the good yeah. story of, that we used to think of in terms of General Motors. What's good for General Motors is what's good for the country. Right. And I think that's not really a good story. But that's actually right. one of those right-sided stories that tries to be, be it's like that whole supply side coming down and trickle down theory, which is really, again, right. the way the right has simplified that right. to make something that seems like a good story, but it's right. actually a bad story. Right. And so I think, you right. know, how do we, uh, how does a progressive side right. find a way to, and I love your, your idea of that, that there's more compassion, I think, on the, on the left and, yeah. and on the progressives. And I, yeah. I think that's a place where we're, it's possible 
to start creating stories that are more inspiring. Yeah, again, it's, it's hard for people's focus to stay on them. It really, I mean, think in my lifetime, we had a war on poverty. Then then that lasted for several years, the Great Society programs at Johnston Institute, a war on poverty. And then it became a war on drugs when I was a teenager. And then it became a war on terror, which is a, a war waged against an emotion, which metastasized into two uh, costly wars on other nations where a lot of lives and treasure were sacrificed. And now I think we just have a, a war on the poor. But we did have a war on poverty, just like we had abolition and suffrage and a vigorous labor movement and um, the civil rights movement and the New Deal. And all of these were, I think, quite beautiful stories that said, hey, it is the role of government to protect people from corporations. We understood in the wake of the stock market crash of 29, oh, they're not looking out for us. In fact, as, as you know, Wall Street is inimical, their interests are usually inimical to the interests of working people. Um, and I, I, I think fundamentally, uh, we've kind of accepted, we've consented to the bad story that if somehow the stock market is doing well, that means Americans are doing okay, or if unemployment is low. I talk with people who are almost inevitably working two jobs or three jobs, right? They're employed, but, and I'm not sure that uh, we, we pay enough attention to what the real sources of uh, people's economic anxiety and anguish is, which is corporations are gonna automate, they're gonna move stuff overseas, they're going to do whatever is cheapest. Your iPhones are not made here. They're made by essentially what we would consider slave labor because it's in the interest, of the short-term interest of the shareholders. I do agree that lots of people work for corporations, but I don't think corporations feel any loyalty to those people. The other thing that we've lost sight of and that almost never gets mentioned, it feels almost outside the boundaries, is to point out really simple historical facts. Does anybody know what the tax rate on the highest earners in this country was under Eisenhower during when America was great, right, the post-World War II boom. What percentage? 90%. Under Kennedy, it was 75%. Yeah. Turns out, if you take that money from the very wealthy, and re who got very wealthy after all, inevitably because you know government was uh, allowing, to creating an environment where they could uh, make all that money, building the roads and educating the workers and dot, 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 and you spread it around, the economy does great. So there are a lot of stories that I think are fraudulent stories uh, that have just been pounded and pounded and pounded and we kind of can't undo them in our minds. And the media, I think, generally speaking, is too lazy uh, or too much driven by their own anxiety about how to keep relevant in a very frantic news cycle. Um, one message that I wish the, the left would send is, I write about in the book, and it has to do with a speech that Teddy Roosevelt gave in 1910. This is Teddy Roosevelt, so he's, you know, at one time was a raging imperialist. And he kind of, as he got older, he got smarter about it, and he could see what was really happening and what, and what uh, government's role really should be. And he really emphasized this idea, I'll read a little passage because I think every candidate on the left should be saying this all the time. He said that um, the founding principle of America should be equality of opportunity. You can really preserve privilege or you can expand opportunity. You can't do both at the same time. And, and I think politicians should be uh, overt about that. He, write, he, he spoke and gave this famous speech and this is what it sounded like. In the struggle for this great end, that is to equalize opportunity, nations rise from barbarism to civilization, and through it people press forward from one stage of enlightenment to the next. At many stages in the advance of humanity, this conflict between the men who possess more than they have earned and the men who have earned more than they possess is the central condition of progress. People should say that over and over and over again. Uh, in our day, it appears as the struggle of free men to gain and hold the right of self-government as against the special interests who twist the methods of free government into machinery for defeating the popular will. Sound familiar? 
At every stage and under all circumstances, the essence of the struggle is to equalize opportunity, destroy privilege, and to give to the life and citizenship of every individual the highest possible value both to himself and to the commonwealth. That is nothing new. All I ask for in civil life is what you fought for in the Civil War. I would be happy if candidates on the left spoke very bluntly in this manner. And I don't, I think they try to sometimes, but it's very tough in a media environment that is unable to talk in serious moral terms. It all devolves into an argument, a brawl that uh, kind of aggregates attention for the sponsors. And I think we're partly responsible for that. If you watch pundits brawling on TV rather than uh, turning away from that, then that's what you're going to continue to see. You're not going to see experts with uh, you know, some historical background or um, you know, journalists who have a level of expertise and can speak to the complexity and nuance of these issues in the larger historical context. You're just going to see political operatives barking at each other. That, ha you know, the, the, our fourth estate is a for-profit industry at this point. And I think the, one of the long chapters in the book is about the Fairness Doctrine, which was the government's last gasp effort to regulate media and sort of answers the question, why did we throw open the gauntlet to bad stories? Why did we not only allow them to exist in our uh, fourth estate, but why did we create the opportunity for tremendous money to be made off of ginning up fear and retailing hate and you know, scaring people to death. The answer is, well, we, know, we, we stopped regulating media. There was a time in which the government was smart enough to say, geez, wow, these tools, radio and TV later and the internet, are really powerful. If they're not regulated, they could become founts of propaganda that inject into the national bloodstream unbelievable amounts of propaganda. And that will degrade the public discourse. There won't be any discussion of policy. There, people won't understand uh, what the nature of the government's function is, how various political actors are either honoring or not honoring the promises they made. They won't be able to get any of it. They'll just be told who to hate, not what to wish for. And um, when the Fairness Doctrine was repealed, the rise of right-wing talk radio and all the rest, um, yeah. So following up on that, why does it necessarily follow that the removal of the fairness doctrine, kind of the governmental mandate to present good stories and bad stories equally? No, that's not what it was. Why does it follow that there is no outlet for good stories today? Um, it, it's not exactly that. It's that they created, they didn't say, uh, what they said is that if you're going to, if you, you, the media has a responsibility to discuss issues of public importance, controversial issues, and to present all reasonable shades of opinion. So what it meant is you couldn't just have one opinion being broadcast 24 seven, that people would have to be exposed to other ideas and other f sets of facts. It was an effort to get rid of what we call echo chambers, to put a spoiler plate on propaganda, right? It wasn't an effort to say, you, you, you know, we're going to regulate exactly what people say. It just said you can't have Rush Limbaugh and you know, his various compadres speaking in one, on one channel for 24 hours straight so that you can move through your entire day only hearing one version of reality. And when that it, it, the danger of that, of course, is that people start to believe in a very different reality that's completely divorced from a factual reality. It's very powerful and persuasive emotionally and psychologically, but it's unmoored from any set of facts. So, you, so that the debate about our health care bill becomes about some bad story, some made-up story about death panels, and there's no room for there to be discussion of the benefits of, the, of, of that legislation. Although now we kind of get it. And it's been very interesting and kind of sad and just um, ironic in a tragic way to see all of the Republican candidates now saying, I'm going to protect, we're going to protect pre-existing conditions when they voted over and over and over again to try to repeal uh, the bill that, that safeguarded those or the law. 
But the fairness doctrine wasn't a panacea, and it did not address that more fundamental problem, which is it is a very easy way to get people to, to listen up, to tell them to be frightened, to, to raise the stakes, to put it in literary terms. If you want to get the reader really involved, tell them that the stakes are incredibly high and they're in danger, and tell them who they're in danger from. That's quite arresting. That's human nature. There's no way to legislate that out of existence, if you see what I mean. Yep. Um, I hope you don't mind if I shift the conversation just for one question. Not at all. Um, I'm a huge fan of Dear Sugar, and I want to thank you for being the original. Okay, sure. And I just wanted to ask you, who do you credit for your development as someone who's really vulnerable, liberal, progressive? Like you're, you're, I think you're a very unique voice mm -hmm. of a man in your age range. I just was wondering, like, okay. where, where does that come from? From reading, from your mom, from your yeah, from my, actually write about it in the book. I mean, you know, we're kind of a, we move out into the world, I think, largely on the basis of how our family operates. So when I was a kid uh, and, and my brothers and I were growing up, my parents had both been a part of the civil rights movement. My mother's mother and father were communists in the 50s who were... Uh, had their careers, at least my grandmother had her career, she was a school teacher in Harlem, um, you know, basically destroyed by HUAC and the work of the House on American uh, Activities Committee. Um, my mom was an early uh, civil rights activist, my dad also was an anti-war activist, uh, and, and both of them were involved in the counterculture which was an understandable mistrust of, of the government, in a sense. Uh, uh, that was, those were the people who raised me. And they were also readers, and they were psychiatrists and then psychoanalysts, so they were interested in the inner life. And I got lucky. I was born on third base. And it's tough because maybe even halfway home, if you know what I mean. And it's tough for people to admit that. I get why people want to push away that idea because it means that if you're a white male, as I am, who was born into a very lucky family, then you have to admit that even though you worked hard and showed lots of grit and went to a great college, I also had certain advantages that made it much easier for me. So I think people feel humiliated by that or exposed in some way. So they front about it. I don't see any value in that. It's just exhausting. You know, it's just a false way of living. It's some, you know, I'm under no illusions. I was very lucky. Um, and the, the only thing you could try to do, which I, I tried to do in bad stories and maybe in other ways of Dear Sugar and so forth, is to, um, uh, I think, have the decency to just tune in to people who were born into a, a shitty story, a difficult story, uh, and to, you know, have a certain amount of humility about saying, you know, I'm just, we're just lucky. Everybody who's an American is really lucky, to be honest, having done a little bit of traveling. And I just think that we are um, squandering great opportunity. The tough thing is you think about all the things that we could be doing, and we're stuck in, in this set of stories that are so regressive and, and adolescent and, and maybe even infantile, and we've got big problems to solve. The one person who recognized... America's vulnerability, I think, more than any other who was you know, outside of the United States, was Putin. There's a whole chapter in the book about um, the bad story we told ourselves, which is that we won the Cold War. But if you're Putin, if you're Vladimir Putin, and you are a young guy who grew up in, in the golden, you know, grew, grew up idolizing the KGB and the Soviet ideal when the Soviet Union was in ascendance, and you saw it come apart, partly in an effort to compete economically and military with, militarily with the United States, and you were actually there in 1989, when East Berlin goes down, the wall comes down, and you were having to hide all those Stasi papers, and you heard George H.W. Bush say, the greatest achievement in my lifetime is that we brought down the evil empire of the Soviet Union. That would kind of stick in your craw. And if your mission was to make Russia great again, you would say, well, I can't beat them militarily and I cannot beat them economically, but I know how they're vulnerable over there. They're vulnerable to bad stories. And he probably also recognized that every empire comes down ultimately because of internal division. 
from the Incas forward, every single uh, empire comes down because of internal division. People start fighting and it becomes balkanized and weakened. And he saw it. I don't think he ever expected that Trump would win, but he could see that in a country where voter participation was 35th in the world, right, where 104 million people weren't voting and you know, only about 130 were voting, uh, that with a media that already had a, uh, a sort of pro set of propaganda outlets that would publicize anything that was inflammatory, that he could even stage a break-in of the DNC. And unlike during Watergate, where the reporters said who broke in and what were their motives, the fourth estate would essentially serve as his press agent and publicize one after another of the allegedly inflammatory emails or speeches that Hillary Clinton gave. I mean, he could see that America had really become susceptible, even more susceptible to bad stories. Always have been, but I think the Fairness Doctrine was a real point where the, the floodgates open. Um, and I, you know, he made, a, he made a very shrewd investment. And I think he had a kind of, I think of him as a geopolitical unicorn, because Trump's mission is exactly aligned with Putin's. He wants to degrade all the institutions that previously we looked at as liberal democracies' trump cards, a free and fair and vigorous free press, an independent judiciary, a law enforcement agency that was above politics, and you just look at what Trump's done and Putin says, check, 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 and he'll stand next to me and beta down to me. I mean, it's quite remarkable when you think about it. But another way of looking at all this is that it's our responsibility to try to, um, I mean, I think of Bad Stories as, as a book that's about faith, ultimately, that really what's happening is people are losing faith in their capacity to make a difference as citizens. And that's, that loss of faith is being exploited, not just on the right, but on the left. As much as I love Samantha Bee and John Stewart and all those comedians, they are actually, in a way, profiting by our loss of faith. They're saying, you know what? Media is all crooked and ridiculous, and politicians in Washington are, are, are all hypocrites, and they're, um, uh, they can't uh, tie their shoelaces. And they're all on the take. And that's really the same message as Trump delivered at his rallies, if we're going to be truthful about it. I think those are brilliant comedians, but what they're doing is taking civic dysfunction and our loss of faith, which is something we should feel real anguish about, as well as the manifest hypocrisy and corruption of our political um, uh, actors, and they're making us laugh about it so that we, we don't get too upset. And I agree, I want to laugh about it, but I also think that if we lose a sense of anguish, in a way, we're kind of... Um, uh, it's being turned into disposable laughs. I think the left is sort of agreeing to view, too often agreeing to view um, our circumstances as a farce, where the right is portraying it as kind of a horror movie. And neither is accommodating the view that we're a democracy that's in a lot of trouble. We have to fundamentally try to right the ship. Um, and, it, and that if we don't, things are going to be really bad for future generations. That's a very frightening thing to try to contend with. Um, I also think there are some stories that are fantastic that I wish I heard more about, like these teachers in all these red states who, even though they couldn't organize formally um, as a union, demanded a livable wage. That's an amazing story. Or the young woman in Michigan who realized that gerrymandering in her state was really fundamentally distorting the way that the political process should work, that politicians were choosing voters rather than voters choosing politicians. And she herself, grassroots effort, no corporate money, just her, her determination and, and whoever she could find to join the cause, she managed to get a, a referendum question on the, on the ballot. And if it passes in Michigan, then there will no longer be congressional districts drawn by politicians in a partisan way, either right or left. They'll be drawn as they should be by an independent commission of citizens. That's a great story. That's we just true in California. Right, right. I mean, it's, you know, <laughs> there are all these pockets of, and, you know, California also said, look, you're not going to enforce a, 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 you know, sort of green 
uh, economy uh, laws and, and you know, uh, then we'll do it ourselves. So there are these good stories, they just get drowned out. And I think as they get drowned out, we lose faith and become more dispirited. And that's by design, in an odd way. The idea is really to not just depress the vote through voter suppression, but literally to just depress people and make them feel that they're the objects of history rather than the subjects of history. So I'm hoping that, you know, as I've thought about it, I've realized, well, gee, I wrote the book and that's probably helpful, but it's mostly a book of ideas. What can I do? So what I've started doing is organizing workshops, because that's what I do. I teach writing. And, you know, uh, it's my own way of trying to just raise money for candidates and causes. Um, and everybody should be thinking, well, kind of, what can I do? That's the proper response. I think we get into trouble when we just sort of become passive observers, hate-watching democracy's demise. Yeah, it's, it's a loss of, of possibility. It does seem like a place of good stories that are happening, or like, the, for instance, these two women that have just won their congressional seats against the, the, the powers of, you know, in New York and in Boston, yeah. you know, for their house seats. Right. And their stories are very much like the kind you're talking about, of, yeah. of uh, you know, groundswell and, and, right. and it's human rights and, right. and doing the kinds of things that we can get inspired by. Right. And, and they're being pretty vocal about it. So that's coming up in the national right. list of context. But yeah. I think they're trying. You know, it's, it's so interesting. You have somebody like um, Elizabeth Warren, for instance, who spent a lot of her life really understanding the intricacies of how corporations try to work the system. You know, she's really somebody with a deep base of knowledge, and her anti corruption bill is brilliant. Totally common sense. Anybody know what's in it? Barely. It barely, again, does she not have a vision? She has a clear vision. The question is whether she can get it out. On the night of the uh, election, uh, the babysitter that we had, because we were going to go out and you know, buy, have dessert, and you know, we were hopeful, um, uh, and she was a young woman who was a medical student, and I said, gee, did you vote? Uh, and she said, oh, well, yeah, you know, um, I didn't really vote. Uh, I, you know, I, I was from, from North Carolina. I didn't get my absentee ballot in time. And I said, "Well, gee, are you aware about what it, where each of the candidates are? You know, because you're going you're going into medical school. You're going to rack up a huge amount of debt, probably. Uh, and you know, they have very the candidates have very different approaches to how your life is going to turn out." And she said, "No, I didn't really. I'm not sure about all that stuff." We somehow have to bridge that gap and sort of have a political discourse that makes people aware of what the stakes are for them personally. And that, that requires, I think, the fourth estate to try to correct some of its excesses and missteps, but it also just requires people to kind of like turn to each other in church and say, what are you doing? You know, I, I, don't, I don't think somebody else is going to save us. I think it's people, individual citizens, because that's really how it's worked in the American story. Rosa Parks didn't stand up on a bus in Birmingham, Alabama, and suddenly the civil rights movement passed. You know, like thousands, millions of people had to put their shoulder to the pendulum. Yeah. Where do you see the sanctuary movement now going forward and the action yeah. that we should accept responsibility for compared to the actions that we might actually be able to yeah, I think it's tough because in, in an environment like the one we're in, the way that immigration is discussed is so, it starts at a place that's so merciless. There's no humility about it at all. And I lived in El Paso, I write about it in the book, so I had a front row view of what immigration looks like. And it's really simple. It's poor people trying to get some place where they have a better chance of feeding themselves and their family. 98% of the time, 99% of the time, sometimes fleeing violence. The way in which that has been turned into a kind of demonized um, makes it almost impossible to have an honest discussion about something, about, about that kind of issue. It's been so ridiculously and mercilessly and cruelly politicized um, that it's just an, a morally and intellectually dishonest debate. It would have to proceed from a place of uh, a, a kind of like, hey, uh, 
here's the appreciable effect of immigration. There is a chapter in, about immigration in the book. And one of the things it says is we've always had this crazy ambivalent relationship towards immigrants. We've had Washington saying, we want people coming to this country. If we're going to complete the project of manifest destiny, westward, westward, western expansion, we need people who struggle to get out of their country without a lot of means and have that kind of you know, perseverance and gumption to drive our national project. He understood that. And at the same time, you had over and over and over again uh, anti-immigrant sentiment. The, you know, against Italians, against the Chinese who were killed in mass, right, and, and virtually enslaved. Forget African American. That's they are Caribbean countries. You had uh, Italians, the, uh, the Irish, the, the Know Nothing movement against Catholics. You had the New York Times calling for Sicilian immigrants to be lynched. The editorial board of the New York Times. This is nothing new, and. You know, the environment in which these debates are taking place are just very mean. There's no humility at all about the, the motives of the people who are attempting to come to the United States and their humanity. And it's evidenced by the fact that we feel okay or we are consenting to a story in which families with little kids are being ripped away from their parents and put into some you know, system of detention. And it's it's the kind of behavior that if other countries did it, we would call it terrorism. We would just be like, that's just a savage bunch of people who are, who are you know, thrown out of the League of Nations and the family of man. So. Can we make the good story about this, as you pointed out, yeah. um, as dramatic and as appealing and energizing as the bad story? I mean, yeah. that is not appealing to the lowest and um, which does energize people, but not positively. Yeah. You know, I, I think there are a lot of people who are part of the sanctuary movement who already are f suffused by those stories, who understand the heroism of somebody who, you know, a mother who travels two, three thousand miles to flee a dangerous country to try to find a new life here. It's much more a matter of the constituencies. And this is why I think about a lot, why I'm trying to be very active in anticipation of the midterms, because the right, in a sense, even though I think that they each are constructing for themselves a very different story, they don't say, oh, I'm a mean racist and I hate people, and that's why, and there's nobody saying that about themselves. We're all the heroes of our own story. They're, you know, building a case that's about law and order, that's about, you know, sort of privileging simple punitive solutions to big complicated problems. Uh, we're all, uh, you know, that's the authoritarian mindset, you know. But they're constructing a set of stories and I think they're going to just do that based on the media that they follow and, and have been listening to and their belief system. You can't do anything about it. I don't think you're going to convince that person to behave differently. You're certainly not going to do that by shaming them which is the place from, from which most conversations between the left and right begin. Trump has figured that out. He'll say they're trying to shame you because they look down on you because they think you're, you know, they, they, they think you're, you're evil and they're condescending to you and that should make you more devoted to me and my way of thinking about the world. What I think has to happen is for us to try to reach out to people who are politically inactive or underactive, maybe I should say, um, and to somehow compel them to recognize that they have a stake in it. There's no reason the United States should have, you know, um, a voter participation rate that's the 35th in the world, that's behind Greece and Turkey and, you know, Mexico. Um, so those are the people I think that we need to expand the electorate. I'm a, I'm a real believer that there are more citizens of good faith who want government to solve problems than there are people who want the government to kind of satiate their feelings but they aren't being reached necessarily. Just a couple more and then we should probably, yeah, shut it down. To that end, um, with the anecdote about your babysitter, do you think a podcast, another podcast, could be a helpful way to kind of spread this conversation? Because I know that yeah. our, you know, your cohort, yeah, yeah. using a podcast in a way that is helpful and educational. And yeah, well, I think there are a number of really smart podcasts. Gaslight Nation, Sarah Kenzier's podcast is really interesting. Pod Save America, I think it's a little flashy, but they basically have their hearts in the right place. 
Um, and I think people are doing that work. What, um, what, what I've tried to do is um, think about what can I do that feels like the best use of my limited power in the world and my temperament. And what I can do is teach workshops where I ask people to contribute $150 to some candidate or cause that they believe in, which allows them to do some research and recognize that there are other people who are doing this good work in the world. We shouldn't be so despairing. There are lots of people who are working in the sanctuary movement, who are working down on the border for civil rights, the ACLU, the Southern Law Poverty Center, uh, you know, uh, and individual candidates uh, who are quite inspiring. When you hear them speak, you say, wow, I'll have some of that. Stacey Abrams in Georgia, or you know, Beto O'Rourke, who are speaking in a, in a more morally forceful, common sense way. So good, support them in whatever way you can. Um, but it gets people, these gatherings get people excited because they realize that they're not just alone with a device, what, hate watching democracy go down the tubes, that there are people who still have faith and are trying to make a difference and are converting their understandable anguish into action. Because, you know, feeling bad about something or sharing a Saturday Night Live clip online is not actually creating votes. It's not getting a better set of political actors. You have to get the better set of political actors before you can start uh, trying to author stories where there's accountability for corruption in government, for instance, or where there is a, a discussion of immigration or the sanctuary movement that's a, more Christian, to put it kind of in simple terms. It's more merciful and, and more aimed at uh, kind of humility rather than uh, sort of law and order and they're all sort of the dark other who are somehow going to take our jobs. Um, so, and that's uh, hard to do, and we'll see on November 6th, because if this isn't enough, you know, I, I, I don't know, I'm fearful, but I'm also hopeful that people will convert that anguish and, and concern into a greater amount of political action. You know, take heart, early voting is way up in Georgia, up by 50,000 votes a day, you know. Well, maybe that's the beginning of, you know, people in a larger way recognizing they will literally disenfranchise us. They're trying to strip us. There is a concerted effort by one of the major political parties to shrink the electorate by any means necessary. They'll use anything at this point. And of course, that's kind of what they have to do. If you're a party with very unpopular policies, essentially plutocratic policies, and uh, at this point, mostly just a single race base, then you have to find a way to shrink the electorate to win elections. Right? So we think, have to expand it. What do you think the goal is on the left? I hope it's to equalize opportunity. I hope it's to start to solve, to look at something like climate change and say, gee, we have the opportunity to fundamentally remake our economy. And if we don't do it, China will do it first. And, you know, we're going to have to, that means there's going to be a disruption of certain traditional, uh, our manufacturing base, right, or the petrochemical companies. They're just clinging on to the last, they're going to wring as much profit as they can. Um, and I think the left has to be bolder about saying, look, there are going to have to be some changes. And, you know, uh, now that we have the political power, we're going to be the adults in the room. The other advantage that the right has, I think, in sort of in a big storytelling sense is they don't have to try to solve problems except for the donor class. They don't have to. If your mission is not to be a, a steward of the planet or of the population that's the most vulnerable, if you don't care about that, then you can just pass massive tax cuts. And when the bill comes due on them, you can say, now we need to cut Medicare and Social Security. You know, I mean, again, I, I hate to be cynical about it, but at the level of the political actors involved, that's what they're doing, kind of right in front of everybody's eyes. And the, they've had to create a set of stories that get people focused on racial resentment um, and immigration and sort of this sort of turbocharged ethno-nationalism, but I'm hopeful that, in, you know, th that in response to the right announcing who they are, the, that people who were previously less politically active will become more so, like me, 
and maybe like you. I mean, I wasn't working this hard during the election, the, two, the presidential election. I just was in Minneapolis and California. I did two of these workshops. On Sunday, I'll do another one. You know, so I'm like, I got a, I got a bunch of kids. I can't, can't mess around. Uh, and I'm hoping that I'm sort of going on the faith that if I'm doing that, that means other people are doing it too. And that's what democracy is. If there's an aggregate of people who are politically active, then it starts to, you get better political actors. And then it's possible for more realistic and compassionate stories to get told. And also just more factual ones. We start to actually try to solve problems rather than tell people who they should hate. Right? But in, in, if you don't, then that, you know, that's what we've had for the past two years. It's, it's exhausting. I don't have to tell you, it's just like, it's just exhausting to see government be so single-minded in its devotion to corruption, you know. Uh, any one of these would have been unthinkable. Um, any, any one of the uh, controversies or evidences of corruption, if Fox News had gotten a hold of Obama's Secretary of the Interior doing this, or any other secretary, it would have been the only thing on the air, you know, for months. And it's just another day at the office. Right, Trump wants wants to make sure there's not a hotel competing with this hotel, so he just moves it off to another. You know, it's you just sort of go, really? It's almost dizzying. But that's what democracy is. If you win an election, then you have the power to behave that way, and the only thing that's going to stop you is other, you know, other political actors. So we'll see. Okay, well listen, I'm happy to sign books if people want to grab them, and thank you guys for coming out. I hope that you'll, um, you know, be inspired. Wherever you are uh, politically, I want everybody to be politically active. That's like the best outcome possible, and that's sort of what Bad Stories is predicated on, trying to get people to. So, thank you guys. <laughs> <laughs>